uh, well, Tomas was kind enough to supply us with his paper and PowerPoint, and Rick has kindly offered to present his paper, which is a fascinating one. Uh, but you might as well know who wrote this paper, even though he's not here. So I will give you a few biographical details about Thomas Gatekins, most of uh, which I'm sure most of you know. Uh, Thomas is the director of the Getty uh, Research Institute. He's retiring at the end of this month and moving back to uh, Berlin, but he has had a glorious run there uh, in um, uh, in Los Angeles. He was previously the director of the Deutsches Forum für Kunstgeschichte, uh, the Centre Allemand d'Histoire de l'Art in Paris, which was an institution that he founded in 1997. And he served as a professor at the Department of Art History at the Freie Universität of, Ber of Berlin. He is an art historian of 18th to 20th century German and French art, as well as many broader fields of art and intellectual history. In 1992, Thomas organized the 28th International Congress of Art History in Berlin and served as president of the Comité International d'Histoire de l'Art from 1992 to 1996. For those accomplishments and other contributions to art history, he has received numerous awards and honors, including an honorary doctorate from the Courtauld Institute of Art, a nice segue there, in 2004, the Grand Prix de l'Académie Française pour Francophonie in, in 2009, and an honorary doctorate from the Paris Sorbonne in 2011. Thomas was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2011, and in 2015, uh, he was awarded the Prix Mondial Sino del, uh, del Duca by the Inst Institut de France. The topic of his paper that Rick will be reading to you is Collecting French Impressionism in Imperial Germany. And thank you, Rick, very much for doing this. <laughs> I'm not going to, in effect, a German accent. <laughs> and there's one passage in which Thomas asked me to ad lib, and I think I'm gonna glide right through that. <laughs> so here we go. First slide. No, he wants this up now, I know. German collectors responded early to French Impressionist painting. Initially, only a small group of connoisseurs in the 1880s, these pioneers propagated the new aesthetic direction that was developing in France to gain more widespread acknowledgement around 1900, and even more intensely until the beginning of World War I, a time when Impressionism became well-known, internationally established artistic movement. In Germany, Berlin was the main center for the collecting of modern French art, followed by Munich after 1900. Collecting and appreciating French Impressionism in Germany must be considered in the context of the political climate between France and Germany. These two countries, a monarchy and a republic, had a difficult relationship after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, as the Dreyfus Affair illustrates best. The emperor, William II, who prided himself on his knowledge of art and his fine taste, hated all modernist currents. He was especially opposed to French acquisitions for the National Gallery in Berlin. He rep his repudiation of French Impressionism would even lead to the dismissal of the visionary director, Hugo von Sudi, in 1909. Indeed, the spread of French Impressionism in Germany was met not only with admiration, but moreover by controversy. The strongly established institutions, including the academies and the Artists' Association, Kunstverein, in Berlin, Munich, Dusseldorf, and elsewhere, were bound to a traditional academic style where history painting persisted as the most important genre and realism remained the foundational style. Adolf Menzel and Anton von Werner, the influential director of the Berlin Academy, were the major representatives of realist painting. Both had relationships with the Prussian court and received official commissions to celebrate important political events, although both with a very different artistic approach. Menzel and Werner were very popular painters. Both opposed the new French style and staunchly um, resisted accepting uh, aesthetic change. 
It's ironic, of course, for those of us who know French art to know that Degas copied this Menzel on the left. Max Lieberman, the most important um, representative of German Impressionist art, and Anton von Werner thus became serious opponents in artistic matters. These two self-portraits reveal both their very different painterly styles as well as social attitudes. And this is where I'm supposed to ad lib. And you should know that I only barely passed my German exam as a graduate student at Yale, so I allow you to ad lib for me. The main argument against Impressionism was that these paintings were sketches, unfinished works, amateurish, a critique which could also be heard in France. However, in our context, it is important to keep in mind that collecting French Impressionism in Germany also meant, in, meant introducing a new artistic direction into a stressed political and cultural dynamic, which was not at all open to accepting the new vision, especially one developed by French artists given the strained relationships of the two countries. Collecting these paintings was a courageous act in opposition to the taste of the majority of the culturally interested public. I will attempt to characterize these small group of elites at the very end of my talk. In the second half of the 19th century, academic institutions and the visual arts in both countries encountered a crisis. France started with the secessions, anti-establishment salon, the Impressionist exhibitions, like those um, which began in 1874. These kind of movements to overcome traditional aesthetic standards also developed in Germany. French Impressionism became an inspiration for a young generation of German artists who would gather in Berlin in 1898, founding the Berlin Secession and officially separating from the Academy and its infrastructure. The secession um, offered artists outside of the academy and its aesthetic parameters an opportunity to public, publicly exhibit their work. Three personalities were instrumental in propagating French Impressionism in Germany. The artist Max Lieberman, who had the financial background to be able to collect these already rather expensive works. The museum director, Hugo von Schutte, director of the National Gallery in Berlin, who acquired the first Impressionist paintings for Germany as early as 1896. And Paul Kassirer, who promoted and disseminated French Impressionism in Germany as an art dealer. For collecting, you need a market. Other gallerists like Gerlitt, Pechter, and Graupe also sold Impressionist painter, paintings, demonstrating the large demand for these works. However, collecting French Impressionism in Germany would not have been possible without an intellectually agile community of art critics before and after 1900. When I say intellectually agile, I mean in both directions. Modernist defenders of Impressionism and aesthetic change, like Maya Greffe and Karl Scheffler, stood against strong opponents and defenders of conservatism and academic rigor, like Adolf Rosenberg. And finally, publications are needed to propagate the new artistic direction to a larger public. Berlin became the center for the creation of new journals, the most prestigious of which was Forum for French Impressionism Art, um, called PAN, P-A-N. Today, I will focus on the collect collecting French Impressionism in imperial, in, in imperial Germany. We will not have time to discuss German Impressionism and the artistic accomplishments of Liebermann, Corinth, and Schlevot, and other painters, which is, is, of course, another major theme to be treated in this context. First, Carl and Felicie Bernstein. We can, in fact, very precisely state when French Impressionism was first introduced to Germany. The earliest collectors were Carl and Felicie Bernstein. Carl was born in Odessa and became an acknowledged professor of law in Berlin. The Bernsteins moved to Berlin in the 1870s where he became a professor at the university. 
On Wednesdays, Felici and Karl entertained the political, artistic, and intellectual society of Berlin. She was a cousin of Charles F. Roussy, the editor of the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, the major French art uh, magazine, and a devoted collector and supporter of the Impressionist. The Bernsteins were inspired by F. Roussy to inquire some paintings by, Ma by Manet, like the Lilacs, which Felicie donated to the National Gallery after Carl's death, as well as Manet's Departure of the Folkestone Boat and Sicily's The Seine at Argente. The Bernsteins also owned lands landscapes by Pizarro, Bert Morisot, Eva Gonzalez, and possibly a painting by Degas. The elegant home of the Bernsteins, which was in the most fashionable area of Berlin, the Tiergarten, was a salon and a meeting point of the intellectual, especially the literary world of Berlin. Karl was a connoisseur of French literature in general and of the novelists of his time. The Liebermans were friends of the Bernsteins. It was in this setting that the famous incident as reported by Max Lieberman occurred when Adolf Menzel one evening took a chair to get a closer look at the Impressionist paintings. And after studying them, he asked Bernstein, did you really spend money for this? These are execrable. Menzel seems later to have been become seems to have later been irritated about his impolite remark, but did not change his mind. It is of interest here to examine somewhat closer the photographs of the Bernstein Music Room in Berlin in the 1880s. The salon combines Louis XVI and neo Louis XVI furniture, probably more of the latter than the former, with Impressionist paintings. The paintings are also framed in neo Louis XVI frames, um, which integrates them into the interior design in a harmonious way. The Impressionist paintings, which appeared shocking to visitors and critics at the first Impressionist salon of, the 18, of 1874, had now found their place in an elegant environment in Berlin's most residential tier garden area. The models for this kind of interior decoration were the Paris salons, especially the gallery of the art dealer John Ruel and the apartment of F. Roussy. Visitors referred to the Bernstein salon as Paris in Berlin. The Bernsteins felt a responsibility to promote this modern French aesthetic. In 1883, their collection of Impressionist paintings was exhibited in the gallery of Fritz Gerlicht, the first public exhibition of Impressionism in Germany in 1883. Paul Dronwell, the Paris art dealer, lent some paintings to sell in the exhibition in an agreement with his colleague Gerlicht. The public response was mostly critical or at best amused. The general verdict was that the paintings were unfinished sketches of topics of little importance. Only a few younger artists seemed to have sympathy with the exhibited works, as Alf uh, Alfred Lichtwach, later the director of the Kunsthalle Hamburg, reported. Oh, that's the music room. I'm mean, sorry I didn't do it in time. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm sorry. That that, uh, that um, Diga is now in a private collection in Dallas. Here. Max Lieberman became a pioneer in discovering and propagating French Impressionist and Realist paintings in Germany. He was a passionate collector and a writer, precise in his, in his formulations to characterize the works of Manet, Monet, Duga, and others. It is not quite clear when Lieberman first encountered Impressionist paintings and started collecting them. In the 1870s, he was devoted to the realist currents, admiring the Barbizons, Corbet, Corot, Millet, Bastien Lepage, an artist that hasn't been mentioned yet, and the Dutch naturalist painters. Although he was living in Paris in 1874, there is no evidence that he knew about the first Impressionist exhibition there. He actually got there later. It seems that it was the Bernsteins who inspired him to engage with Impressionism and to acquire paintings, especially those by Manet in the later 1880s. Lieberman was at his, this time recognized already as a painter who regularly exhibited at the Salon Paris. At this time, he admired Manet and even tried to get in touch with him personally. However, because of the Franco-Prussian War, the patriotic Manet refused to welcome the German, though he did acknowledge Lieberman's paintings. And in fact, this is one of the most tragic uh, stories in, his, in Lieberman's life. One, one knows more about it than this. 
While we don't know exactly when Lieberman acquired his first Impressionist painting, in the 1890s we discover the beginnings of his feverish collecting. Photographs of his music and living room in his house in the Permisserplatz, although this is a, a later photograph from circa 1930, show the same interior, st interior style which we have seen at the Bernsteins. Oh, that's it. Okay, there we get that. Paintings by Manet, Cezanne, Monet, and Degas are clearly recognizable in the music room. Um, Manet's Ro Roses, Tulips, and Lilacs, which he got in exchange for a portrait he painted of Bernstein, Cezanne's The Fisherman, and Monet's Moulin Près de Zandam. From the 1890s onward, he continued to enlarge his collections, which can be recognized in photographs at his house in Perisseplatz, his villa at the Lake Vanze, and his own paintings of his studio. He'd built a collection of more than 450 paintings, many of them by French Impressionists. Lieberman owned, and here are the photographs of the other places, Lieberman owned 16 paintings by Manet and many more by the Impressionists, such as Renoir's Greenhouse and Monet's Chant de Coquelicot, shown here. In 1904, he bought a painting by Degas at Paul Cassirer's gallery, a study of ballet dancer, which he called My Parthenon Frieze and a landscape by Van Gogh. So and you can see the Parthenon Frieze is now in the Cleveland Museum, one of the great Degas in America. In examining Lieberman's acquisitions, it is obvious that he privileged paintings which kept the immediate and spontaneous character of the artist's handwriting. He seems to have looked for sketches and unfinished works to understand the technique and the artistic approach of French colleagues he admired. This is clearly visible in the um, portrait of George Moore, which he acquired from Drawwell. This predicted predilection for the sketchy aspects of modern painting also is visible in the portrait of uh, Monsieur Arnaud à Cheval, which Lieberman bought from Cassirer in 1913. Lieberman also owned one of the studies for the flight of Rochefort, an early acquisition probably from the uh, art dealer Pechter from Madame Manet in 1898. Oops, I skipped. Lieberman also owned paintings by Pizarro, Cezanne, Sicily, etc. Then our next part, and you can see this, is Tsudi. At the same time and in full accordance with Lieberman, the director of the National Gallery, Hugo von Tsudi, acquired an important collection of Impressionist paintings for his museum during the first year of his employment, 1896. And of course, he got into trouble. The National Gallery was opened in 1876, although the wrong date, 1871, can be seen on the entablature to unite paintings from all German states in its collection. Sudi's first acquisitions, however, not only brought foreign paintings into the gallery, but even worse, they were French. He thought of them as the guidelines for modern art, art and argued the role and importance of German art could only be evaluated in comparison to those of other con countries. Opposition and protest were quick to follow. Sudi had traveled to Paris with Lieber Liebermann and bought three masterpieces at Durand Well. La Salle, let's see, oh there, wait. Oh no, I've gone too far, I'm, I'm sorry, here we go. La Salle by Manet, um, the Rue de by Monet, is that going to come up? Yeah. And con uh, Conversation by Degas. So these were bought on the trip with Lieberman. This had to be handled somewhat discreetly because the emperor and conservative members of Anton von Werner's academy, who served on the board, were trying to control the acquisitions policy. Their interest was in dedicating the entire budget to paintings by German artists in the ac academic tradition. Because of their close relationship, it was easy for Anton von Werner to convince William II to prevent the acquisition of modern French paintings for the National Gallery. Hugo von Sudi, however, insisted on promoting this modernist trajectory. He found a support group of private collectors, like the industri industrialist Edouard Arnhold, who started to collect French Impressionism and helped Sudi with donations and financial support. Other collectors of French Impressionism inspired by Lieberman and Sudi were Ju Julius Elias, Otto Gerstenberg, Robert Mendelssohn, and others. 
Many French painters, paintings entered the German museums with the help of private funds. However, before mentioning some other collectors of, of French Impressionist art in Germany, we must first look at the activity of Paul Cassirer um, as an art dealer. He was an important, is, am I in the right place? Yeah, I yeah. am. Sorry, I haven't done this before. He was an important mediator in propagating French art in Berlin and Germany in general. He created and incorporated a new way of art dealing which would become the model for the famous art dealers after him, Kahnweiler, Walden, Flechtheim, and others. He represented not only a business, but moreover a harbored a great fascination with the new artistic vision, French and German Impressionism. He supported artists by contracts and promoting their art. He was preceded in this kind of engagement by French dealer collectors like Choquet and Volard, and in certain ways by Dorowell. Cassirer was, in, in, was instrumental in organizing the exhibitions of the secession, serving as secretary and even president of this as, association. Cassirer not only discovered young artists, organized exhibitions for them, and supported them financially, but most importantly, he also established his own exhibition program of major European currents of modern art, which inspired collectors all over Europe. His most critical connections were the artists and art dealers in Paris, and he represented French Impressionism in Germany for the last years of the 19th century until his death in 1926, when also Monet and Mary Cassatt died. But he also supported the German artists Lieberman, Schlevolt, Corinth, Ketekolvich, Barlock, and others. The gallery continued to operate after he died before being dissolved in the Nazi period. Cassirer was an intellectual with some bohemian character traits. His apartment, his gallery, and even his country house in the Netherlands were meeting points for his literary and artistic elite. The Cassirer family was a large clan with important members engaged in both industry and the universities, one of them being the influential uh, philosopher Ernest Cassirer. An essential element of Paul's business strategy was to combine his gallery with a publishing house, which was directed by his cousin Bruno. Paul and Bruno, though, later separated their enterprises, promoting new artistic movements through an even larger publications program directed by um, Bruno. And you see them here. The list of exhibitions from the last years of the 19th century through to World War I and beyond is overwhelming and demonstrates Cassirer's intense engagement with modern art in the face of resistance from the emperor. The members of the academy and the general public, which was biased towards an aesthetic and academic taste. The exhibitions were famously documented um, in the volumes published by Bernard Echte and Walter Falkenfeld, who's in the audience today, which contain also precise descriptions of the public response by critics and visitors alike. Just to give you an impression, I will name only a few. 1898, Degas, Monet, Pizarro, and Renoir. 1900, for the first time in Germany, Cezanne. 1900, 1901, 02, Van Gogh. 1903, Munch. 1905, Monet Retrospective. 1906, the famous collection of the opera singer Faure, mostly Impressionist paintings. 1907, Beckmann and Van Gogh. But that would have been fascinating to see. Um, Delacroix, Goya, Cezanne, 1908, Munch, and Matisse, presumably not together. 1909, 45 paintings by Cezanne. 1910, the Manet collection by Auguste Pellerin and Kokoschka, etc. So this is a little list of the exhibitions that Cassirer mounted for which there were publications. In his exhibitions, he included often paintings um, which had already been sold, like Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe, which was exhibited in Berlin in 1899, and Manet's Borrow Follage Bergère, which is today at the Courthold in London. Cassirer called his gallery Kunst Salon. Critics acknowledged his vision by start uh, by stating that the Kunst Salon was more than a gallery. It was rather a museum of time, which introduced uh, the newest developments of modern European art. Cassirer's Kunstsalon was the location where collectors were inspired to acquire Impressionist paintings, like the already mentioned Edward Arnon. 
He had made a fortune in the coal industry, and his house, again in the Tiergarten in Berlin, contained one of the major collections of German Impressionist paintings by Leibel and Liebermann and others, surrounded by French Impressionists. Here you can see Thomas is so good at this. Look at that. And you have to go to New Haven to see that, man, eh? Okay. Da, 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 da. In his house, he also had uh, portraits um, of Bismarck and William, Wilhelm II, which demonstrate his political allegiance, so he could be a radical in his other paintings, but he was a patriot in his portraits. It was not a contradiction for him to collect French modernist paintings. He knew, of course, about the criticism by the emperor regarding these works. Another important collecting family were the bankers Ernst and Robert von Mendelssohn Bartholdi and their relatives, the Oppenheims. Both families were clients of Cassira, who provided French Impressionism for their mansions in Berlin. I have no time to present these collections in detail, but would rather mention one last collector, Otto Gerstenberg, who brought together, um, together probably one of the most valuable collections of paintings of French Impressionist art in Germany before and just after World War I. Gerstenberg was in the insurance business in which his innovative ideas helped make insurance generally popular. He began by collecting engravings, but around 1900 started to be fascinated by French painting from Romanticism to Impressionism. These two famous paintings by Manet and Degas represent the high quality of Gerstenberg's collection, which was in part dismantled during the Nazi period. However, most of the paintings were stolen by the Russian army and brought to St. Petersburg, where they still are. I'm not wearing my Russian hat when I speak. I'm wearing Thomas's hat. After the Tsudi affair, after this very short and abbreviated um, presentation, collecting French Impressionism in Germany, especially in Berlin, may sound as, as though it was an obvious, even common way for the industrial and intellectual, mostly Jewish elite to decorate their homes. However, we should not forget the context in which our story takes place. These collectors were a minority and their works of art not at all generally accepted. The best illustration of these historical circumstances is the so-called Sudi affair. The director of the National Gallery was again in serious trouble in 1907 when he wanted to buy some French paintings, mostly of the Barbizon school. It is unclear if he had the approval of William II or not. Sudi declared that he did, however the emperor denied it. Sudi was relieved in his duties for a year Anton von Werner, the conservative director of the academy and an adversary of Tsudi, was installed to replace him, like the enemy in the, the fox and the hen house. In fact, Willem II tried to remove Tsudi from his position for good, but because of his popularity with collectors, he was later able to return. However, he decided to leave Berlin for Munich. The fabulous collection of the French Barbizon Impressionist paintings in the Neue Pinakothek in Munich, in Munich is due to Sudi's term as director from 1909 until his death in 1911. To give you an idea about the taste of um, Emperor First, I am showing you some paintings which were exhibited in 1909 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I think that's this one in New York and in effect to propagate German painting in culture, or to, in culture increasingly amenable to French case. Another major event illustrating the ongoing critical response to French acquisition was the famous protest of German, German artists. In 1911, Karl Wienen, today a somewhat forgotten painter, initiated the manifesto by which German artists protested against the bias of German museum directors, especially Hugo von Sudi, in acquiring more French than German works of art. You can see the winds of change. The acquisition of a Van Gogh landscape by the director 
by the acquisition of, of, of Van Gogh landscape by the director at the Kunstmuseum uh, Bremen was the immediate cause of this radical action. This complaint was heavily discussed heavily in the British press all over Germany. Closer studies concluded that bias was not, in fact, the case. However, for art historians today, it is revealing to understand that this was a widespread feeling around 1910. Impressionist French art could not easily be acquired by German museum directors. They nevertheless found ways to enlarge their holdings, but only with the help of the collectors who played a major role in disseminating this modern movement in Germany. Later that same year, 1911, the year of Zudi's death, a second pamphlet, in Kampf und die Kunst was published. Museum directors, critics, and artists protested against Wienen's manifesto and defended modern art in the acquisition of French paintings, hailing their new potential to herald new artistic and aesthetic visions. It is in this context that collecting French Impressionist art in Germany should be considered. Of course, this struggle between academic art and a new aesthetic direction also existed in France. However, weight of a complicated relationship between the countries and the active role the German emperor and the academy played in all questions concerning the arts made it difficult to propagate and find acceptance for Impressionism. Supporting modernism was therefore often interpreted as an attitude of political opposition. And although many collectors did not hide their national identity and loyalty, they oftentimes encountered suspicion because they belonged to the Jewish elite. Their intellectual and cultural interests and above all, their international connections were not fully welcomed in German society and definitely not accepted by the Prussian nobility. A cautionary ending, thank you. <laughs>